So, Jake, uh, what do you want to talk about today? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I should know, shouldn't I? Oh, these slides took me a long time, and I don't think it's worth the payoff, but uh, let's find I out. I was going to say, they don't look that good. Shut up, mate. <laughs> Hello, Surma. Hello, Jake. So I occasionally get comments on the video and, and people think I'm Surma and people think you are Jake. So I think we, mm. we should sort that out. And, and you see what I did there, right? I, I've, I've called you by your name. I don't usually shout my own name out. Um, but maybe, <laughs> maybe we could put a little thing along the bottom which makes it like super clear who's who. Because, you know, oh. it's important, yeah, for our, like, important for our individual brand identity. <laughs> Anyway, we've talked a lot about uh, the size of images, right, and how to make them small. But I want to dive a bit deeper and look at the different styles of loading an image. When I see a page like this, uh, it feels like there's something missing, but I don't always know what. I mean, it's good on you that the space, that there is a blank space, because on many pages, we don't even have blank page, a blank space. And you think, oh, this site is ready to read, and you start reading. And then things start moving around, and it's really frustrating. Oh, yes. The absolute worst thing that can happen here is a layout shift. But this site, this site has at least left the space for something. But is it a photo? Is it an illustration? Is it a graph? Is it a piece of interactivity? Like, it, it, it could be you know, more than just a, a, an image. So. A smaller image at this point will reduce the time that the user is in this kind of what's going on phase. But we can actually do something while the image is loading as well. And that's what I wanted to, to focus on in, in this episode. You might have seen some sites do this. I was going to say, are you going to talk about blur hash? Because that, that had attention for a while. Yes. So this is a blur hash or you know some other form of making it clear there's an image here. It could just be a couple of gradients or something like that. Um, and I would say when I see this, it's clear to me now that there's supposed to be an image here. It's probably not a graph, but it could have core content in it. Like it could have text mm -hmm. over the top. That wouldn't be obvious from this view. Um, what I'm essentially saying is sometimes if, a, if there's a, a slow loading image like this, a lot of the time I don't care. I'm just going to read the content. But you only do that once you know the image is just illustrative of the content. Like it's not a core yeah. piece of content in of itself. You can solve this problem by throwing more bytes at a preview like this. And once I see this, I'm like, right, OK, it's a kid, kid with an ice cream. Fair enough. It's just an, you know, it's supplementary content. So I can just go ahead and, and, and read the article. And in the meantime, the image can continue to load. And that's a much faster user experience compared to like having nothing and then the image appearing you know, fully loaded. Uh, meanwhile, the user's just staring at a blank area wondering what's going on. But there are many ways to, to tackle this problem. There are some solutions which are pretty new, and there are some which are almost 30 years old. And I'm going to try and co cover all of them <laughs> in a small video. I'm going to start with the old one. I'm going to start with JPEG. That's the 30-year-old one, right? 29, I think. But there have actually been innovations in this area even in the last few months. I want to talk about those as well. So here's an image that's pretty hard to compress for whatever reason. I don't know why this is a really difficult image to compress. Uh, I guess it's because there's lots of sharp lines, um, lots of different areas of the image, different things going on. I mean, so here technically, I... it's probably quite easy to compress. It will just look Yes. <laughs> and so I was trying to avoid that with this image. And it oh. turns out you have to throw a lot of bytes at it in order for it to not look terrible. Um, especially in some newer image formats, it's harder to compress this image in new, uh, newer image formats, which is unusual, but does happen. But with JPEG, they're both 300K. They look pretty good. They're both the same quality. But they're quite different in how they're encoded. Here's how they look when they're loaded over a, a 2G connection. I, I made it super slow so you can see what's going on. Now, I'd say that the one on the right feels like it loaded faster. Like You could tell what the image was a lot sooner. In fact, it kind of feels like the one on the right has finished loading, but it hasn't. It's still filling in tiny details. These are, you know, they take the same amount of time to, to load because they're the same size. Right. There are people who don't like the effect on the right of it loading in multiple oh. scans like that, but I think they're wrong. But I mean, don't don't you remember from? I mean, I certainly do from the dial-up days where most images 
not most, but many images behave like the one on the left, the, the progressive, not progressive, but just like with a line by line appearance of the final image. And then your internet would cut out or buffering would happen or something happened just when the, the core part of it was about to happen. Like there's the, the character I was waiting for or something, and then the image just stops loading. Nothing is more frustrating. Exactly. And whereas the one on the right, which, yeah, is a progressive JPEG, you get like this low quality version first, and then it comes in and, and fills in the tiny details. The one on the left is not progressive. Some software calls it baseline, although that's sort of a slightly different thing. But, you know, they sometimes use that to mean a not progressive as well. A baseline JPEG can't be progressive, but it also means it can't do some other things. Anyway, Squoosh, the image compressor that we work on, uh, that creates progressive JPEGs by default, because we, we like it. Uh, we use MozJPEG, Mozilla's JPEG encoder. Uh, although there is an option in there to create the non-progressive kind if you really want, for, for whatever reason. Now, I said there'd been an innovation here. So I want to take a look at that. Chrome and Firefox have received an update to their JPEG decoder recently. Um, so here's what it looks like compared to Safari, which, which hasn't. So three, two, one, go. And it might be difficult to notice the difference if you're watching this on like a small YouTube window or for you, Surma, who's watching it through a teleprompter. Um, but it's really noticeable at full size like for, for real users. Here it is up close. This is the first pass in Safari. You get this blocky nearest neighbor uh, scaling. Whereas in Chrome and Firefox, you get this much nicer, smooth appearance. And that's pretty new. Like Chrome and Firefox were blocky until recently. So. Is the the blocky part? I think they call that the the DC layer, right? It's literally just the because JPEG divides the image into eight by eight blocks. Are those just the eight by eight blocks with one solid color, basically? Yes, that's right. It's the it's the DC part uh, of the encoding. So it's solid colors. Um, and yes, what you're getting in Chrome and Firefox is just a, an interpolated version oh, of that. That's clever. Uh, so yeah. Most uh, progressive JPEGs will have the first phase just being the, the DC information. For, so for... they're both basically the same data, just that Chrome and Firefox are applying a post-processing effect on the decoder side to make it look more pleasant while more data is being loaded. Yes, this is literally the same image in loading in each browser at the same speed. That's what you saw there. I just did a, a screen capture of it. Yeah. So. Chrome and Firefox use libjpeg turbo as their decoder, whereas Safari uses a custom one, I think, a, a one that Apple made. Um, so it doesn't have this benefit yet. They might add it. Also, Safari's decoder sometimes just doesn't decode progressive images in a progressive way. Like It just waits until the whole image is there. And I don't know why it happens with some images and not others. I don't know. I guess, I guess it's some bugs. Um, but we also have bugs in our decoder. And I found some uh, bugs just making the, the slides. So one of the reasons it took me so long to get these slides together is I started finding bugs in our decoder while making it, so then had to go and file those bugs. We sometimes fall back to this blocky effect too early, like where we shouldn't. And that's something we need to fix. Um, but JPEG is actually really amazing as a format because you can script, like when you're encoding an image, you can script what the progressive passes should be, like how much detail each pass should have. Uh, what detail it should be missing, and how many passes it should have in, in total. It's really flexible. Uh, we might actually ship our own in Squoosh. That makes. Yeah, I saw you had like a draft PR open, and I saw you know you were throwing, like moving around some, some C code from the Mods JPEG encoder. And I never realized, and I, you know, I ported the Mods JPEG encoder originally, and I never realized that we had detailed control over the, the individual passes, as they are called, of the JPEG decoding. Um, that's really, really cool. Yeah, so what Moz JPEG will do is it it does the DC pass, like those uh, eight by eight blocks, and then it as, as soon as possible gives you like a a low quality version but with a bit more data. And that's actually not great with the the new decoders that uh, Firefox and Chrome are using because it throws them into a sort of more blocky uh, output much earlier than we otherwise would. So what I'm trying to do with the uh, Dawn in Squoosh is to avoid that mid-step, but still deliver uh, you know, a sharp image as soon as possible. So I'm not going to ship that yet, because I want to wait until we fix our decoder bugs, because then I can get to see exactly what the difference is. Uh, but if it's still better, then, then we'll ship that. But yeah, I'll, I'll put a link to all of this stuff uh, in the description. All right, 
that's enough about JPEG. I want to play a little game, and it's oh called Guess the Format. And I'm going to show you an image loading, and it's your job to guess what image format it is. OK. Um, it might be JPEG. It might be something else, because it could be a different form of JPEG. Anyway, here we go. Three, two, one, go. What you thinking? You still think? Are you still there? <laughs> I, th I'm trying to think. I think that might be PNG. Oh, well, uh, but, well done. Um, no, you're, hey. you're correct. Uh, I'll give you that in one. That's this is the lesser spotted interlaced PNG. So this is a a, a feature of PNG that's not used so much. It uses a form of interlacing called Adam 7, which means it's seven scans. It starts off with a 1 8 resolution image, a bit like the, the JPEG uh, we saw before. And then it, it doubles the horizontal resolution, then doubles the vertical, then the horizontal, then the vertical. It, you end up with seven passes uh, in total. GIF has a similar thing, but it's only four passes, and it only improves the vertical resolution. It, it starts off with the full horizontal resolution. Oh. But what I will say is, don't do this. Uh, don't <laughs> use interlaced PNGs. It makes, I mean, you've been looking at PNG compression and uh, uh, JPEG XL compression recently, how it uses the, the pixel before to do prediction about the next mm -hmm. pixel. This form of interlacing makes that very hard. Uh, so it yes. ends up being about 20% bigger. It's not great for compression. Um, generally, PNGs should be quite small. Uh, so they don't really benefit from this interlacing thing. I, I would say if you're targeting an old browser where you need the alpha transparency, but otherwise it's photo data, so it's a huge PNG, maybe do the interlacing thing, uh, but otherwise, no. Uh, Squoosh doesn't do this right now, but I have a draft PR ready to go. Do you know what? The only reason I didn't like push this PR your way is I thought it would give you a clue to this question. I was hoping you would get it wrong, but you got it right anyway. Uh, but we'll ship interlaced PNGs in Squoosh off by default, of course. Nice. I like it. OK. Another question. Here we okay. go. OK. I'm ready. Three, two, one, go. What could it be? Ah. There you go. OK. So there was no progressive step in that sense. It was full resolution from the very beginning, just top to bottom. It has alpha transparency. Um, so there was so some not... form of progression. Like it, 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 you, you saw some intermediate steps, but as you say, it was, it was just a top to bottom scan. It was just yeah. a scan line, basically. So yes. this has proper alpha transparency, not just a mask. So uh, And the amount of colors, I'd say GIF is out, JPEG is out. Um, it could be PNG. It could be AVIF. Uh, I guess it could also be JPEG XL, but I actually don't know. I think JPEG XL progressive is the whole point that they're marketing is that it's the same progressive rendering as JPEG, so it would probably actually start with a low resolution. I am going to say it's got to be JPEG or AVIF. Uh, not J uh, PNG or AVIF. PNG or AVIF. Um, I'm not sure how I would distinguish those two just by the progressive render. I I'm just going to put my money on AVIF because you haven't had that yet. It's a reasonable bet. Uh, but in this case, this is a lossy. I forgot WebP. about WebP. I'm, I'm so <laughs> I was say, the one you didn't mention. I think if you thought of uh, WebP, you would have you would have guessed it was. Uh, but it is specifically lossy WebP. So yeah, top to bottom scan, no fancy progressive rendering like JPEG has. Uh, part of this is because JPEG is an image format, whereas WebP is an image format created from the keyframes of a video format, a VP8. And video formats do not need multi-scan progressive rendering. They just need to display one frame at a time. Uh, so it's not something WebP can do. In fact, uh, from what I'm told, it was actually a lot of effort for them to even make the top to bottom rendering work. It, it was yeah, They had to do a lot of uh, shifting around of, of data to make it work. But there was another element of the load there, which is interesting. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to compare lossy WebP with lossless WebP. Lossless WebP is like a whole other format. It's not related to the video codec at all. I'm going to start them now.
Now, the lossy version finishes first because it's a smaller file. But notice how it took a lot longer to get started compared to the lossless version. Yeah. Now, I have a hunch. What, go on, then. What's your hunch? I think, um, you know, lossy WebP is lossy. But one thing that I have learned throughout our work on Scrooge is that it's very hard to lossy compress the alpha channel. And so if you have lossy data, you probably have to encode the alpha channel separately lossless, because otherwise the progressive render is going to look really, really weird. That's, that's correct. Uh, I would say correct answer, maybe not entirely the right reasons. Um, oh, but OK. It's, it's more of a product of it being uh, derived from a video format, again. Um, what these formats tend to do is they, you know, they they encode channels one by one, uh, and this was the thing that was difficult for WebP to, you know, untangle. So they were like delivering things together, but they didn't do that with the alpha data. So the alpha data sits at the front of the file. Uh, yeah, and you're correct; it is lossless. It uses lossless WebP uh, for the alpha data. It sits right at the front. So that weight that we had at the start was at loading all of the alpha data before it could start adding the color data in, which is, you know, invisible. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, I mean, they could have done it the other way around, but alpha data tends to be smaller than the, the, the rest of the data. Uh, whereas lossless WebP, because it's a pixel by pixel compression, it does the alpha data along with each pixel. They could have found a way to interleave the alpha data, but it, it especially would be in a completely different format, not easy. And lossless alpha does work, uh, something AVIF does quite well. Um, but yes, that's not how WebP does it. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that AVF can compress loss, loss fully, loss fully, uh, compress alpha and not have uh, and deal with the artifacts that might happen. It works really well. So WebP will struggle if you've got like a lot of gradients and stuff in your uh, alpha channel, whereas that's where AVIF will, will do really, really well. All right, next format. Here we go. Three, two, one. Any early guesses? Um, Ta-da! There we go. <laughs> um, so that is an image format that has no progressive capabilities. That's correct. Um, actually, now that I think about it, I don't even know why I was considering AVAF, because I think the whole point is that AVAF currently doesn't do progressive, because again, it's a video format thing. It's probably AVAF. You are correct. Yeah. This is it. The AVIF decoders in Chrome and Firefox, they don't have any intermediate rendering at all. It's not even clear whether they can. Um, I think maybe the same problem again, like the uh, the two color channels are brought in first, maybe. Uh, it, it might not even be possible for them to ever do any kind of, uh, you know, sc even scan line or progressive rendering here. And I sped that up compared to the other demos we've seen. I think AVIF is magic. It's my favorite image format right now, especially because it's in Chrome and will soon be in Firefox. Uh, I've written a big blog post about how great it is, but there are some kinds of images that it struggles with, and this is one of them. Uh, I had to throw so many bytes at this image um, to prevent like ugly flat areas appearing. It, it ended up bigger than the JPEG in this case. Uh, it's one of those outliers. Not usually how it goes. It's usually a fraction of the size of a JPEG, sometimes like a tenth of the size, and it still looks OK. Not, not the case here. I mean, that's the whole point of, of Scrooge, where you can try these things out. Because I think one of the things that we really want to get people to understand, like there is not a single image format to rule them all. Like There's different types of images where different image formats excel at. And so it's often the case of actually taking the time at the very at the important images on your website, the big ones, actually take the time and look at what Squoosh has to offer in the different formats and use the ones that work best for that specific image. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I, this way that you get nothing until you get everything with an AVIF, I've been proposing a way to mitigate this. I, I know you've seen this already. Uh, it looks like this. So this is a 4.3K AVIF put with a, a blur filter over the top. Uh, so it's a tiny little image that can sit at the front, especially compared to like 300K for the full image. Now. Without the blur, it looks awful. <laughs> kind of very sort of alien, almost art in some way. But yeah, once you apply the blur, I think it looks like a, a really good preview. And the AVI standard already allows multiple images to be in one container, and those can be tagged as like thumbnails. So what we're going to look at is, you know, if there's a thumbnail at the start of the image, 
we could show that early uh, in the browser and then like maybe apply this blur filter to it. All just ideas right now, but I'm, I'm hoping we get something like that. So you'll, you'll get a preview like this straight away and then you'll get the final image once it, once it downloads. And I mean, yeah, if, if the, the final image is 300K, adding another 4K isn't really that big of a deal. It's an increase by 1%. So your users can get a preview of the image much, much earlier, especially for AVF. Like if you think you're you know you're on 3G, um, downloading 4K will be significantly faster than downloading 300K. So the time difference, so the user sees something, will be massive. Absolutely, and I'll put links to the spec discussion and some more demos of, of this effect uh, in the description. All right, one more example. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. A little gap at the start. Oh, and there we go. And you know, I don't know if you can see this. You might not see it on the smaller screen, but we've got kind of these. I can see that there's yeah blocks appearing of higher resolution. It, exactly. Uh, so this is like a a two phase progression sort of like it, you get the low detail DCT uh, similar to G JPEG, the eight by eight squares, and then it's going and filling in uh, the, the the full resolution uh, block by block. This was a, a JPEG XL. Ah, that would have been my guess. Well, it's the yes. one left. Because that's the one that was there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this doesn't work in, a, in any browser yet. JPEG XL is behind a flag in Chrome and in Firefox, but there's no progressive rendering yet. Uh, a little bit like JPEG, there's multiple ways that progressive rendering can be done. Uh, and that can be done at the, the encode time, but also the decoder has, has some say in the matter as well. Um, this was the settings I was recommended. It can do more passes and different kinds of passes. Yeah, currently in Chrome and Firefox, it, it loads more like an AVI, AVIF. You get nothing, and then you get the, the whole thing. But JPEG XL has been designed with this progressive rendering in mind. So hopefully, that's what we'll get when it lands in, in browsers proper. So where does this put us? We've got these three formats that have some kind of progressive nature. We've got JPEG, we've got JPEG XL, and then we've got the hacky idea of the AVIF with an extra image at the start. And no PNG. Oh, I'm not including that. It's rubbish. <laughs> the image is so big, it's not worth it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to load them all at the same time. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. JPEG still does really, really well here. Um, JPEG Excel gets to full detail a lot faster because JPEG Excel was the, the, I could get to a decent quality with a much lower file size with JPEG Excel in this case. Um, in, the, in the way that I couldn't with AVIF, it, it did a much better job of it. Um, but then, yeah, so JPEG XL gets to full quality um, quicker than JPEG. But JPEG got to the lower quality quicker than JPEG XL, and that's really tiny AVIF with the blur filter. That was that was there first, but it takes forever for it to get to the, the full version just because it's such a, a huge image in this case. I'm really excited about the different in innovation in this area and different directions that this is taking. My gut feeling is still that I will be probably using AVIF for most images on the web because I'm I'm quite happy with the kind of loss that I get with AVIF. Like it smooths images a lot, but in most cases, um, a bit like the the image I started with, like the kid eating ice cream. You don't need full detail. You just need to give the uh, you need to not look ugly, but you uh, just need to give the impression of what the image is as soon as possible. And AVIF tends to do really really well with that, but the philosophy of JPEG XL tends to be more for like big, high quality images. So things like Unsplash, uh, Flickr. Uh, if you've got a, a a news website, but you've got a dedicated images page, then maybe JPEG XL is going to be the better thing to put there. Um, and you get this lovely progressive rendering uh, to go along with it, which is I'm really excited about that. I mean, I'm I'm actually also quite excited to see if and how WebP2 will fare in the battle of progressive rendering because. One thing, for me at least, that web that sets WebP apart is JPEG XL was designed with the web in mind. AVF wasn't designed for the web at all. It was designed for video. WebP is not designed with the web in mind, but specifically for the web. They made a whole bunch of shortcuts with like, we are trying to find a format for the web. JPEG XL wants to work on the web, but also work in other use cases. And I think that different scoping will allow them to 
have a whole bunch, take a different trade-offs than what JPEG XL is doing. As you were saying, like they're actually, JPEG XL does really well at high quality images in my experience, um, not necessarily at the let's make it look good with less bytes at screen size necessarily. Like they do there well sometimes as well, but not all the time. AVF, in my experience, does better in that scenario. But I do wonder if WebP2 will make interesting trade-offs and become a contestant here. Yeah, and it's really too early to tell with WebPV2. It's it's all sort of hype right now, although we do have it in Squoosh, a, a preview. But I do like the way they're heading. They're heading, like, what can we do that's similar to AVIF, but with all of these web benefits uh, on top? And if they deliver on that, then my favorite will switch from AVIF to WebPV2, if they deliver on that. Because I know they're looking at all of the progressive stuff as well. So it's, yeah. We'll do another episode on it uh, when when there's something to show there. But it's it's in Squoosh if people want to have a play, but it's it's super experimental right now. In the meantime, there are other techniques. Uh, I showed you this page earlier, but with a blurry preview. You mentioned blur hash. I'll put a link to that. That's a, a way that you can create these previews in just a few bytes. Uh, in this case, it's 50 bytes. But you also need to ship a decoder for that, which is kind of Fine if you're a native app, because you can just put that along with your APK or, or whatever. But on the web, if it's your main image, then shipping a decoder along with it becomes, well, you have to factor it in, certainly. Um, it's only 1K. It's super small, uh, 1K with broadly compression. But if you're talking 1K and then a few bytes for the images themselves, you know, here's what a, a 1K WebP looks like with a blur filter over the top. Like you get much more detail for around the same size if you factor in the, the size of the decoder. And also, you know, it's it's JavaScript reliant. It can potentially break or not even run for some people, and it will probably, you know, it will occupy the main thread. While this kind of image decoding can happen off the main thread, uh, there's a lot of trades off involved in shipping your own image format versus using something that the browser already supports. Yeah, and in terms of trade off, it's worth mentioning that the, these blur effects are not free. Either they can actually be pretty expensive, so that's always something to to measure as well. Versus like you know, yeah, what kind of trade off are you making there with that with that blur filter? So it's not something I would use a lot on a page. But yes, like really, the, one of the best ways you can deal with this thing right now is just use a format with a nice progressive render. Like if it's a big image, JPEG is right there right now uh, in Squoosh. You can use this uh, progressive rendering stuff. Um, and yeah, it's an old image format, but sometimes it will give you that best result, especially for for you know, images that are like 100K, 200K. Um, if you can get down to 20, 30K with AVIF, then it's, that's a better option. But yeah. In, in I find it case. really interesting, as you say, JPEG being close to 30 years old and actually still, it is literally competitive to the next gen formats in some scenarios. Because really it's designed for the web. Um, I'll also put a link to a discussion where the uh, largest contentful paint metric is, is looking at uh, how they should consider a progressive image rendering, because they don't right now. Um, so I'll put a link to that, because they're, they're going to consider some kind of uh, like cutoff point and amount of detail as good enough. Um, so that will be very important when we start getting more uh, progressive formats, especially things like JPEG XL. But that's all I wanted to cover. Yeah, that, I, I think that was a good episode, Jake. Oh, thanks, I mate. I enjoyed it. I learned something. Cheers. I learned something yeah. <laughs> hey, do you know what? As long as you press the little thumbs up icon, that's that's all I care about. <laughs> it's gonna be one, one thumbs up, eight hundred down. Uh, but oh, now I've said that, it's gonna encourage people to click it. Do you know? What? Never mind. Edit this bit out. Just don't don't show this bit. Lucas, cut this bit out. Cut this bit out. Definitely cut this bit out. Bye. <laughs> Bye. We've talked a lot about the the size of images, right, and how to make them small. Ah, okay. Because you said I was wondering where you're going with ice cream, but yes. Well, probably don't have that slide on the screen yet, so... I mean, that's um, up to Lucas, <laughs> whether this reference works or not. It's going well. Uh, but I want to dive a bit deeper and look at the different styles of loading an image.